So time for a whole bunch of rapid fire tips for playing Imperial Guard in 9th edition. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today I thought we'd experiment with something a little bit different. Rather than going through one subject in quite a lot of detail, I thought we'd just go for a bit more of a general scattergun approach for tips for playing the Imperial Guard, and move over them quite quickly, not quite so much explanation, but just my general impressions of playing the army since the Codex dropped in early 8th. Obviously there's plenty of different ways to play the army, and I'm not saying that all of this is gospel. If you disagree or want to clarify any of the points, please let us all know down in the comments. In any case, let's jump straight into it, and talk some quick tips for playing Imperial Guard. First up, Guard are great, a really fun faction to play in Warhammer 40k, and kind of stand apart from the rest as they're a bit more grounded in real life. There's nothing like taking on a galaxy of horrors with nothing but your lasgun and faith in the Emperor, and it feels like it gives you a bit more of a relation with your guys on the tabletop than quite a lot of other armies. Making a Guard army can be quite an effort, but it's well rewarded on the tabletop, they look absolutely great with ranks of infantry and tank formations, and Guard players do tend to be quite heavily invested in their labour as a result. Some of my favourite units currently in 9th edition are these, Infantry Squads, Scions, Officers for Orders, Chimeras, Demolisher Tank Commanders, which I seem to have misspelt as Rank Commanders here for some reason, Manticores particularly with the full payload upgrade, and Bulgrin for a bit of melee support. I think at least starting around a bit of a core of these and you can't go too far wrong, with plenty of other options being decent, but maybe just a little bit more niche or specialised for certain battlefield roles. For regiments, these are some of my favourites, I really quite like the Kastachans, their infantry are really solid in melee, and their tanks are quite decent with their damage boost on the multi-shot guns. Custom regiments can both be great for infantry and vehicles, you can get gunnery experts and spotter details for your vehicle regiments, and wilderness survivors plus disciplined shooters for your infantry. Otherwise, I think that Cadians have quite a bit to offer, a flat damage boost, a useful stratagem, relic, warlord trait, and knight commander pask, and the Vostrians are quite a solid option as well, a solid range boost and a really useful stratagem, just for a damage boost wherever you need it. Again, not saying that other regiments can't work, but these are some of my favourites competitively. For standard infantry squads, I'm really not a fan of grenade launchers or flamers in the unit. Out of the special weapons, I think they're just overcosted compared with the competition. Guards really don't tend to struggle for anti light infantry firepower, mass las guns with first rank, second rank fire, and plenty of volume fire found throughout the army. Particularly grenade launchers are just not worth the 5 points investment. Flamers aren't too bad up close, but I just don't really think that they add anything different that you might get from some of the more punchy weapons. Talking of which, if you are thinking about forward moving squads upgrading with special weapons, I strongly consider either plasma or melter. 5 points really isn't a bad upgrade for one of these powerful guns on a cheap platform, and it allows your infantry squads to do a bit of damage to heavies or elites. Often though, people will run squads with absolutely no special weapons whatsoever, just literally last guns, and it means that your priorities aren't split at all, they can literally just focus on going for objectives and mowing down light infantry with last fire. If you're issuing orders to infantry squads, one helpful trick that you can use with orders is if you happen to be out of range of an order on an infantry squad, you can get your company commander to issue move 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 to themselves on their first order, then they will immediately move right then, and that might be enough to get them in order range of their chosen target with the extra movement that they've just gained. It can be pretty helpful if you need to get some orders all the way to the other side of the board, or if you just slipped up with positioning a bit, and your squad is just outside 6 inch range. Not ideal, but it could help fix that slip. These are some of my favourite guard warlord traits, not focusing on any of the regiment or scion specific ones. Grand strategies can rustle you up a few more command points over the course of the game, for a 5 point command point regen. Old grudges can be really quite a powerful shooting buff, a 6 inch aura of reroll or wound rolls against one chosen target. That's really nice to put down with a couple of tank commanders, or maybe with an artillery firebase with some manticores. And if you do just want a few extra orders, you could think about Master of Command, might be particularly useful for tank orders. It is quite common competitively though, to swap out a warlord trait for a tank ace ability. Often this seems to be the way to go, particularly people liking full payload on manticores. If you do want an extra guard warlord trait and you are running a scion detachment, you could think about using Progeny of Conflict to buy in one other warlord trait. This is quite interesting as it doesn't have to be one of the unique scion ones if you don't want it to be. And it could potentially be a way to get, say, command point farming on the board, or old grudges or something, in addition to the extra tank case trait that you might want. For Lehman Rust turrets, I think that the Demolisher really reigns supreme at the moment. It does have short range, 
but it's over twice as good against armoured targets as the standard battle cannon. That big D6 damage is really nice, and it's easily the most efficient anti-tank firepower in the whole book, particularly in combination with Vostroyan or the custom regiment trait to give the extra 6 inch range, demolish cannons are awesome. Otherwise you could consider the battle cannon mainly for the extra range so you can keep your tank commander a little bit further back. The executioner plasma cannon is a bit cheaper and can be really quite good anti-marine firepower even at the risk of mortal wounds and the punisher gatling cannon does cost a bit more but it is your anti-horde choice if you want one. Really just for the damage breakdown I just don't think that the exterminator auto cannons, eradicator nova cannon or vanquisher cannon are worth it. I feel they're all solidly outcompeted by other options and they all struggle to break through even against their exact optimal targets. Hopefully they might see a buff whenever a new codex comes out. Guard can do an interesting off the board special weapon squad spam. Take a fair few command squads or special weapon squads, they're all quite low power level so you can put loads of them in strategic reserve for cheap, and equip them with maximal plasma guns or melter guns. It can give you a relatively cheap and effective strike force where they just turn off the side of the board and do some hefty damage and can help you to really point and delete a few key units which you might struggle to have dealt with anyway as guard can sometimes struggle to bring their masses to bear. Currently more people tend to use tank commanders compared with the standard Lehman Rosses. I did a bit of math hammer on a previous video on the channel which you can search if you like. If tank commanders order themselves to reroll ones to hit they'll typically do 27% more damage for the points invested but the Rosses will have 22% more durability on the board for the same loadout. In general, it seems that people would much rather have the bigger punch rather than the extra durability, and tank commanders do have some other advantages. They're less punished by hit roll modifiers such as minus one to hit or the vehicle degrading itself. Tank ace traits are more efficient on them if you choose to use them, and of course you do have the option of changing out your orders to something else if strike or shroud, the regiment specific ones, or the extra movement would be preferable. Guard can be quite good to field as multiple different regiments within the same army. A quite common option is to split the tanks into one detachment and the infantry into another. Say for example you could take a bunch of demolishers, manticores and hellhounds or something and run them in the custom tank regiment with gunnery exploits plus either spotter detail or jury rigged repairs. That will give them a nice damage boost with either a range boost or a healing boost on top of that. Then combine all the infantry with a regiment that makes them a bit better. Maybe cast Cham for the nice melee and character support, or perhaps wilderness survivors or disciplined shooters, just to make them a bit tougher at range. The other option will be going for something like a Scion Regiment, giving you a dedicated deep strike force, which could accompany one of the first two. If you're running Hellhounds, I'd deploy them with explosion range in mind. The last thing that you want is to have a Hellhound right in the middle of your entire army, your opponent gets first turn and blows it up, then you roll a 4+, plus, which you can't command re-roll anymore, and you have about 10 units taking d3 mortal wounds. Really make sure that you set these up on the flanks of the army, or somewhere that your opponent isn't going to be able to shoot them dead turn 1. I really quite like the Kath-Chan melee combo for guard. It's quite cool being able to turn a mainly shooty army into a really quite close combat heavy one, and just bury your opponent under tons of strength 4 attacks. Take Iron Hand Strachan and a Ministorum Priest, they're both given aura of plus 1 attack, and any infantry squad in range of that pair, will get a good 31 attacks at strength 4 from each 55 point squad, which is just really quite efficient melee considering they also have some ranged output too. It can definitely justify putting power swords on the sergeants and any nearby platoon or company commanders as well. They'll be going all the way to strength 5, and they'll be quite worth it with those bonus attacks. If your opponent does decide to tag one of these squads in combat with something fairly tanky, you could really surprise them. Say this Chaos Venom Crawler has tagged the squad in green in melee, and now it's your turn to try and strike them back. A fun trick that you could do is move the back squad in red up behind them, use one command point to consolidate squads, and then suddenly that Venom Crawler has a big 20-man Kastchan unit in combat. Move Strachan and the Ministorum Priest within range of that big blob, each of those will now have three attacks. Then in the shooting phase, you can issue the Fixed Bayonets order to make them immediately fight again. That means that you should be getting 60 odd attacks in the shooting phase with them, really not too bad at strength 4, plus maybe a power sword or two, and then they'll also be able to fight in the fight phase as well, theoretically netting you around about 120 attacks over the course of your turn, just for 110 points of models, plus a couple of supporting characters. Even things like toughness 7 vehicles might well be filling the herd with that much rage coming at them. If you do happen to be playing Chaos, I'd think about saving command points for Vengeance for Cadia, I'd say out of every stratagem in the guard book, this is the one where you get the most bang for the buck by far. Full rerolls to hit and wound every turn for a unit is really worth having. 
I will literally just earmark 5 command points from the start of the game, make sure that you don't touch them, and then apply it to your biggest hitting unit each turn, or the one that most needs a damage buff. It's great on literally every guard unit that's shooting, and one trick that you can potentially use is again to use that consolidate squad stratagem, so you have one big combined 20 man blob, issue first rank, second rank fire to them, then you have almost 80 last shots with full rerolls to hit and wound, that's going to stack a decent amount of saves on virtually any chaos unit. Wolgrins can be ridiculously tough, one of the most defensive units in all of Warhammer 40k with the right buffs. Take a big unit, somewhere between 6 and 9, I'd have most of them with slab shields, maybe one or two with brute shields for some imbals, then run an astropath with them for psychic barrier, and use the take cover stratagem in the shooting phase, and then you've basically got a 2 plus save with a plus 2 to the saves, so if the enemy attacks you with AP minus 2 weapons, you're still saving on a 2 plus, and if they attack you with AP minus 3, then that's still a 3 plus save. If you can tow one model into light cover as well, then that could give you even a plus one to save above that, and it just means that very little is going to be efficient at shifting these. I would put in a couple of brute shields for a decent invul save, just in case you get targeted by something incredibly high AP, and you could also consider a Ministorum Priest to give them all one extra attack for when they get into combat. Can be a reasonable unit to try and take the midfield. For my least favourite units in the book, there are honestly quite a few that seem a bit outclassed by other options, but these are some of my very least favourite. The Death Strike has needed a decent rules workup for a while now, it's unreliable to fire, doesn't do that much damage when it does fire, and often will fire too late to actually affect the game in any meaningful way. Such a shame, as it's really quite a cool model that looks like it's launching an ICBM. I think the Tower Rocks is pretty much directly inferior to the Chimera. A tiny little bit of extra speed just really doesn't outweigh the extra toughness and the extra transport capacity for me. Weird Vein Psychers, again I'd say, are a bit rubbish, they cast their powers really unreliably, I would have Astropaths instead. And I really don't like any heavy weapon squads with the direct fire weapons, things like heavy bolters or auto cannons. Their damage output is still kind of mediocre, and they take so little enemy firepower to deal with that it's just kind of laughable. Mortars aren't terrible if you do need a little bit of anti-infantry ignores line of sight firepower, but you need to make sure that they're just not exposed. I find the guard relics are at least somewhat underwhelming on the whole. I'm not sure it's usually going to be worth buying in lots with command points, but these are some of the ones that I'd think about for the free relic. Kira of Aquila can farm you a few more command points, just put it on a character that's going to be safer most of the game. The Blade of Conquest isn't too terrible on a company commander or platoon commander, it gets you up to strength 5 and damage 2, and it does mean that they could kill maybe a space marine or two in close combat, though I'd still not be expecting wonders from guard melee. The Dagger of Tassart could be interesting for certain units to outflank one powerful unit, I would weigh that up against Strategic Reserve though, which wasn't a thing when the Guard Codex first came out. But it is quite nice because it's a bit freer, they could turn up right in the opponent's deployment zone from turn 2, and if nothing else, I guess the Laurels of Command could give you a few more orders. I quite like some of the regiment specific ones a bit better, it's hard to turn down the Relic of Lost Cadia in a Cadian army, gives you a turn of more efficient shooting that you can do on the move if you need to, and if you do happen to play Chaos, you can basically turn the Bearer into a mini Gilliman for a turn. For the Valhallans, Petrov's Mark 45 is really nice, means that morale just isn't really that much of an issue for the core of your army. And for the Lambda Lions, I do like their Refractor Field Generator. A 5 plus Inbor save handed out to all the nearby Scion units isn't too bad to help them survive a little bit longer against enemy return fire. In general, people don't tend to use the Specialist Detachments from the Visualist Defiant book all that often. Though technically they're still 100% legal for normal match play, it's just if you're playing the Grand Tournament mission pack that you're not allowed to use specialist detachments. It's kind of a shame this, as a couple of the formations do give a genuine power boost to the guard. The Emperor's Wrath Artillery Company makes Basilisks and Wyverns so much more effective. Firing twice for 2 CP is no bad thing, nor is either AP-1 on the Wyvern or ignore cover. I really like the Emperor's Fist Tank Company as well. The Hammer of Sundrance Battle Cannon is just a great relic and it's quite useful to have a 1 command point option to be able to move your full distance and still shoot as if you're grinding advanced. That one's just quite a nice to have on your big gun tanks. There are another 3 formations that all have their uses as well, but these two are my favourites. For tank cases, probably the most bang for your buck that you get is getting damage 3 missiles on the full payload manticores. It's hard to ignore strength 10 damage 3 missiles raining out of the sky, and it makes them a lot more efficient on 3 wound infantry or any big tanks and vehicles that are hiding out of harm's way. Otherwise, if you're not going to be using two of those, I'd strongly consider the options on the tank commanders. There are four options that I'd really consider. 
either minus one damage or plus one save for a bit more durability on a aggressive one. Reroll wound rolls of one for a nice general damage output boost, or maybe AP minus one better on the turret weapon, which is pretty handy to stack on the Punisher Gatling tank, as it makes them far better at dealing with things like Space Marines or any armies that are in cover. If you're running a separate detachment of Scions, I think the better regiments does depend on what sort of thing you're going for. If you're looking to run a really, really big detachment, or maybe even an entire Scion army, I suspect that Lambda and Lions might be one of the best ways to go. A flat AP-1 on everything is pretty handy over your entire army. Quite nice that it also affects close combat attacks as well. Their Relic and Warlord trait are both handy as well. Reroll ones to hit is hard to go wrong with, and the Refractor Field keeps your Scions safer. Otherwise, for smaller detachments, I actually think that other choices could be better. I think one of the best is the Ioten Gorgons. They're the ones that get a stratagem to drop a unit just outside of 5 inches of the enemy, and that can make them an absolute nightmare to screen against. Your opponent can't just screen out 9 inches and forget about them. You could be delivering melter weapons within melter range, or hotshot las guns within rapid fire range. The damage buff against the closest unit isn't bad either. Otherwise, Capic Eagles could be interesting if you're trying to make Valkyries and Scions work. And the Ioten Dragons, I think, are quite good with their extra range to rapid fire weapons. If you just want an absolute ton of hot shots with first rank and second rank fire, these guys can have their hot shot las guns in range right out of the drop. I think that Guard can both profit from and be quite useful as allies. If you're running a combined Imperial force, they can offer some cool things. Manticores are some of the most efficient, ignores line of sight firepower in 40k right now. Fast moving obsec with infantry squads and move, move, move is really nice to have in the army or even just some allied scions for deep striking, and providing either some precision firepower or utility units to help win the objectives game. I also think that in a mainly guard army, a few choice allied units can really shore up some of their weaknesses, even having just one or two really hard-hitting melee punch units, maybe things like Blood Angel's Sanguinary Guard, can entirely change the dynamic of the army, and means your opponent can't just charge straight at you, and exploit the weakness that your army isn't generally all that great in combat. Otherwise, just some really high quality, high ballistic skill shooting is not bad to have. Things like Space Marine Eradicators or Dreadnoughts, or efficient units from the Sisters or Adamek Codexes. Inquisitors and other Imperial Agents are another option as well. In particular, one slightly fun combo could be an Inquisitor plus a big unit of Conscripts, who seem like they're really quite a good match for each other. If you take an Ordo Hereticus Inquisitor, he can take a Psychic Power that gives you a 5 plus invul save to the unit, and he also helpfully provides them a really nice leadership aura as well, to stop them taking quite as many casualties in the morale phase. For 150 points plus a 55 point Inquisitor, a big blob with a 5 plus invul save just to march onto the midfield objectives and hold them isn't the worst thing, even if realistically they're not going to do all that much damage to the enemy army, unless they're fighting against really light infantry. You could even combine that with an Astropath with Psychic Barrier, for yet more toughness on the same unit. Talking of which, if you are going for Guard Psychers, I would generally recommend Astropaths as the best choice. They still cast a Guard Psychic power at full strength, they don't eat up a valuable HQ choice, and for saving a fair amount of points for the loss of the ability to do full strength smite, I really don't think that they're the worst choice. Not eating up a valuable HQ slot is also quite a nice thing. I'd say the most helpful ability that they have is Psychic Barrier, plus one to the saves of one important unit each turn is really nice, and it's viable on basically anything, whether or not it's a basic infantry squad, tank commander, or a Bulgarian Death Star as we mentioned. I'd say that spell's near mandatory if you are thinking about taking a super heavy, as why wouldn't you want a Bane Blade to have a 2 plus armor save if you were thinking about taking one anyway? Otherwise, Night Shroud for minus 1 to hit at range is quite good too, though I would personally take Psychic Barrier first. And for a fun unit, you could think about Psychic Maelstrom, an 18 inch focused Witchfire that can be an interesting way to snipe out enemy characters, as you can select them within an 18 inch range even if you can't see them. If one of your opponent's characters takes damage, this could be really quite a nice way to finish them off. Deathcore combat engineers can be really dangerous indeed. I'd ideally deploy them via a Chimera as opposed to deep striking them. The main reason to make sure that you get their gas grenades in range. You can use one command point to have the entire squad throw a grenade, and then between 10d6 shots, you get an average of 35 AP-2 damage one shot. They hit on a 3+, get blast bonuses against hordes, and they wound any non-vehicles on the roll of a 2+. plus. They're just monstrously efficient anti-infantry if you can deliver them. On average, that's around 6 or 7 standard-sized space marines dead, or 20 guardsmen if you do need to flatten some traitors. One quirk of the full payload tank ace trait is the hunter-killer missile buff it gives. Full payload gives you max damage on your random damage weapons, 
Of course, it's most useful on things like the Manticore or the Basilisk Damage D3 main cannon, but if you did happen to take a Hunter Killer missile on the same tank, it also amps up its damage to a big fat damage 6. It means that in theory, having a 5 point Hunter Killer missile on the tank isn't the worst upgrade in the world. It's still fairly likely not to get through armour, as it might miss and it might not wound, but for 5 points for a single shot, it's not the worst upgrade either. I would weigh that up as to whether or not you actually want to expose your tank to direct fire though. Usually Manticores do want to be hiding out of line of sight if possible. If you're playing Cadians, then Creed can have an interesting interaction with tank aces. It can nominate him as your Warlord, but then pass up taking his Warlord trait for an extra tank ace trait, though because he is nominated as your Warlord, he still gets the plus two command points for his tactical genius ability on his datasheet. If you are playing Cadians, this could genuinely be another incentive to have Creed around, basically a free two command points while he still double dip on the tank ace traits. Sticking with the Cadians for their overlapping fields of fire stratagem, this gives plus one to hit against one target for your entire army, but with the annoying provision that you need to actually trigger a wound on the target to be able to activate this in the first place. I've seen a fair few players take a squad full of sniper rifles, or even just a few sniper rifles on random infantry squads, try and fish for a mortal wound on your chosen target with the snipers to start with, and then if you do get lucky and punch one through, then you can use this two command point stratagem and have it affect all of your big guns, rather than having to waste firepower by firing it at regular ballistic skill until you do get a wound through. Obviously that's a bit of a points investment in a potentially fragile unit, but could be an interesting use of 30 odd points if you do have a few spare in a Cadian list. Finally for the stratagem jury rigging, it's one command point to heal one wound on a guard vehicle. I think it's really quite inefficient for the actual repairs that you get out of the stratagem, but if you get a damage boost out of it then it is actually quite good. If your vehicle is just bracketed by one wound, and you put it up into its top or middle bracket, I think generally combined with the extra wound that you've gained, the stratagem is quite well spent. Definitely one to consider at the start of your turn, if you do have a command point spare, and one of your vehicles is just out of its bracket. So I think that just about wraps it up for the day. I hope you've enjoyed 30 random thoughts on playing Imperial Guard in 9th, and please let me know any of your own insights down in the comments below. Let me know if you've enjoyed the format of the video as well, I could potentially try and do a few of these for other factions, though they do take a fair bit of time and effort to make. If you've enjoyed the video then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics, where I'll most certainly keep the regular 40k content coming, with new videos out basically every day. I'm sure we'll have plenty more for the Imperial Guard. Finally, if you have been enjoying the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention the All Specs Tactics Patreon page, which you can find down in the video description below. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, including seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next for the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways, with a chance to win some really big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, then the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.